You're listening to The Rich Life Revolution with me, Michelle Cooper. My mission is to empower you to step into your next level of wealthy. You'll hear all the deets, a little bit of inspiration, and real life takeaways so that you can create your own rich life revolution. Let's dig in. Welcome to the Rich Life Revolution. I'm your host, Michelle Cooper, and today's episode, episode six with Julie Cole, is a really great conversation for any entrepreneurial mom. It's a great conversation for anyone, but if you're a busy mom and you're an entrepreneur, you will definitely want to check out this episode. Julie Cole has spent over 20 years building a business that in Canada is one of the greatest success stories. It's called Mabel's Labels. And Julie and a couple of her friends saw a problem. They identified a problem and they came up with a solution, a label, something as simple as that. And they built a multi-million dollar business, which many of them exited in a very different financial landscape than they started. And Julie's going to share her story with us. But, you know, it's not enough to build a seven-figure business. During COVID, Julie wrote a book. She decided to take advantage of that quote-unquote downtime and wrote her outstanding book, which is called Like a Mother, Birthing Businesses, Babies, and a Life Beyond Labels. So Julie's going to share with us some really great tips on how to balance all of those hats, juggle all of those plates, do all the things, including how important it is to surround ourselves with good people, how we need to become master delegators, and to always remember that someone's watching. Let's check it out. I would love for you to share a little bit about yourself in your own words. I've got some amazing things to share about you, but tell us all about who Julie Cole is and what she's been doing. I'm Julie Cole. I am the co-founder of Mabel's Labels, which is a children's product. We created it 20 years ago. We just had our 20th birthday. So that's been exciting. And on top of, you know, that entrepreneurial life, I'm a mom of six kids. I am um, a writer. I do a lot of media and a lot of public speaking. So yeah, I'm pre- I keep myself busy and out of trouble for the most part. Michelle, can you say the same thing? And the, <laughs> the author of this amazing book. I know you mentioned writer, but I just want to plug this. Like a mother. I love that. Birthing business, babies, and a life beyond labels. That's it. That's been my, that was my little COVID baby. When everybody's picking up side hustles during COVID, I was like, well, I can't travel anywhere for work. I can't speak at conferences. I can't. So I thought, well, I'm never going to get this kind of time gifted to me again. So now's the time to do the book. Awesome. So I'm going to reference a couple of things in this book, because if anybody hasn't read this, they should. And I specifically want to drop some gold here. But, you know, Mabel's Labels is a great Canadian success story. Yeah, yeah. Look, it is, you know, so important to a product is its brand. You know, we were the four moms and the hammer in the basement making labels 20 years ago between, you know, uh, changing diapers and and. and daycare drop-offs and that sort of thing. And I think, you know, the, the, I think we were so relatable to our market, right? Which was also moms. And because moms are such word of mouth people, you know, the word about Mabel's labels just spread. And then of course, once social media hit, it really spread because the moms were owning like the blogging space and Facebook and, and it acted as a vehicle for word of mouth for us. So that, you know, honestly, our customer base has done a lot of the work for us, but as, as you you know, Michelle, like the reason why Mabel's Labels started, and I would say you need to know your why. And we had two. There was a product missing from the market. My co-founders and I had little kids and we were losing stuff and permanent marker wasn't working. So we thought there must be a product out there and there wasn't. So 
you know, good product idea. That was the first one. And then the second one was that at the time, my eldest child had just turned three and was diagnosed with autism. And I joke that I'm a recovered lawyer. I just didn't think the traditional workforce was going to suit my family any longer. I really needed to be able to advocate for him. I needed to set up an ABA program, turn my basement into a therapy center, because I just, all the research told me how I would get best outcomes with this kiddo. And uh, quite frankly, he had just turned three and already had two younger siblings. So it was already busy. So that's after Max diagnosis. That's when I said to my co-founders who are all like friends and relatives of mine, Hey, what do you think? And there we went and we haven't looked back. Clearly, like I know your story and you talk about it in the book, you bootstrapped Mabel's labels, like your first website paid for with a foosball table. <laughs> it's true. I think that's pretty awesome. <laughs> uh, right? Yeah, it's so true. I mean, anyone who starts up and actually this is particular for women entrepreneurs. We are very hesitant to go for like funding or investors. Uh, we tend to bootstrap. We tend to go for love money and like ask our parents if they can lend us something or a friend or, you know, we, we'd go for that. We are a little bit risk adverse when it comes to, comes to the finances. So and I always say it in the book, I talk about your net work being your net worth. And so for us, we needed, you know, we're a web-based business. We needed a website. And this is 20 years ago when a lot of e-commerce companies were just kind of getting started and people weren't even sure if they would put their Visa card in the computer machine, right? Right. <laughs> because they were afraid <laughs> about the computer machine. So... Fortunately for us, talking about using your networks, we had a couple of pals from university who were IT nerds and we had no money, but we had a foosball table and they had the skills, but wanted our foosball table. So we said, if you build our mailless labels website, we will give you a foosball table. So there you go. This entire e-commerce business that makes millions and millions every year is built on the back of a foosball table. <laughs> Yeah, I just love that. You know, like it's it's such like doing whatever it takes, right? right. Like, like you talk about in the book, like calling in your resources, right? Kind of rounding up your people, like who can do what. And I think that it's so important. Like when I started my business, like my first ever little journey into entrepreneurship was a little boutique, and I it lasted two years. I called it my university degree in entrepreneurship because it taught me everything I needed to know. But literally, it was me getting my friends to come in and help me figure out how to hang lighting and paint walls. And my husband's friend built our dressing room in the store. And it's like, who could do what right now? Because I know. And like, literally, you write it like we sat down and wrote a list of all of our friends, we a list of anybody who could help us. And that was to like teenagers in the neighborhood who come play with the babies while we were making labels. That was like our friend who's in big box retail. What kind of knowledge do they have? An accountant friend, a lawyer friend, like all of the friends. And we just, we weren't afraid to ask the questions. And I think for us, we just left our ears at the door. We knew we didn't know much. We had no problem asking the questions. We There was no stupid question. And we always said, and I say this to my kids, no's are free. People can say no. Totally. Might as well ask. Yeah, absolutely. One of the things I highlighted in your book, which I really wanted to share with people because I think this is very inspirational. You said moms can build businesses after bedtime and create business plans during play dates. <laughs> right. I think that is so true because I've done that. You've done that. So clearly it's a fact. Yes. But some of my best business ideas have come from just conversation with a friend while our kids were doing something. Absolutely. And you know, it's interesting to Michelle, because the unique thing about starting your own business is that you also get to create a culture that you want. And because at Mabel's Labels, we knew that we could build a business at non-traditional times, non-traditional places. We also knew that our employees could be productive in non-traditional spaces. So it was very interesting because we've always been very results focused and not focused on presenteeism. So we're like, we don't care if you're sitting at your desk for eight hours a day in that, like if you need to go and to your kid's Christmas concert, go like, we don't, we don't, you know, so we got to create that. And it was fascinating because when COVID happened and all these companies were like, ah, oh, now that people have to work from home, we have to get them set up with tech. We need to do this. We don't know how to manage remotely. We don't, we've never managed people remotely. We've always based it on this presenteeism. We were already set, like our people were already set up because we've already honored being results focused. So it was interesting how when COVID hit, I feel like the female entrepreneurs were winning. 
Absolutely. I agree. That's the year my business exploded, my current business, right? You're such a serial entrepreneur, aren't you? You're I know, such right? such a serial um, entrepreneur. I love it. I know. Uh, I know. I can't stand it. It's in it. your genes. But yeah. really, I always say that the pandemic actually, I know that a lot of people lost their lives and it was had really awful consequences. In my business, it was uh, like it catapulted us to a next level. And it also, like we were already kind of half virtual based team. We had a brick and mortar, but we also had virtual employees and like remote employees. And we moved completely to remote workforce. Like I always say to my team now, like there's 20 something of them now. I don't really care. I don't care when they work. I don't want them to overwork. I want them to be available during a client's availability times, right? But I don't really care if they got to go to the doctor or go to school or... Right. I don't even want to hear about it. Like, just put your out of office notification in case somebody's trying to get a hold of you. And I always say, you treat, yeah, you treat adults like adults and they're going to act like adults, you know? Right. I have had a couple of instances where people took advantage of that. And so we had to figure out some things. But that really was a case of that person wasn't the right fit for the company. Well, I was going to say that, Michelle, that is perfect because to me, I'm like, when those people people when it's not a fit they're not the people who you want on your bus they're not aligning with your core values so what we learned and what we started doing is we've incorporated our core values into our interview process and really made sure that it's aligned so that we don't get those people in the first place right so yeah but you're absolutely right there was probably some other thing that wasn't aligned there yeah love that oh absolutely absolutely those early days so you've described the foosball table the working in a basement the you know all the things that we all do when we're starting our business. I call them the unglamorous early days. <laughs> I think they're a reality for many of us. But what I also find is that sometimes people will compare their beginning to somebody else's middle or further, right? And so they'll be like, oh, look at you, Michelle, on holiday on a yacht in Croatia. I want to do that. But I'm, you know, year 15 in my business. <laughs> I know. I know. And you know, we do know that comparison is the thief of joy. What you think you see on people's social media is the highlight reel. You're not seeing everything. And you know, I think there is entrepreneurship is hot right now and it's highly romanticized. You know, people think, oh, well, look at Julie. She goes on TV all the time. She wrote a book, you know, she she speaks to big crowds, she travels. Blah, blah. And it's like Really what it looks like is putting the kids to bed at eight o'clock, not sitting down with a glass of wine and watching Netflix. It looks like going into a basement and making labels until 2 a.m. for years on end. It means leaving the lawyer salary and the career and just, it's a tough slog. So, you know, sometimes you gotta remind people, I've been in line for 20 years, you know? <laughs> like that's, this is not an overnight success. We have all put in the hard yards. Well, I know. I actually said that to somebody. They were like, well, you're, you know, like you're this amazing overnight success. I'm like, this is a 10 year long overnight. Yeah, that's the longest <laughs> overnight I've ever had. <laughs> and, I've had and I've had some long ones. <laughs> I know, right? Like, I was like... This does not feel like an overnight at all. Yeah. So I do feel like it is something that gets romanticized and people think they know it. And, they, and even like they think, oh, entrepreneurship would be great. So great not to have a boss. And I'm like, oh, no, you have you have more bosses. You've got your 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 team, your co-founders. You've got your your um, suppliers. You've got your customers. You got more bosses than any other job you've ever had. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And they all got their opinion about what you should be doing. Right. And it is a lifestyle. <laughs> Like if you want to clock out at five o'clock, well, you know what? Maybe entrepreneurship isn't for you. I know in those early days, if I get a call to do an interview at eight o'clock at night, I'm doing it because this is my money. This is my business. I will do anything to keep it going. And that means a lot of a lot of personal sacrifice. Yeah. And so you and I, we met in a network business masterminding kind of community, right? And I, you know, I remember, I feel like you were getting to the end of a home reno or something like that. And there was like all this stuff going on and, you know, we're all really busy in that world, but you had a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Look, well, cause remember too, that was COVID. So what happened was we had done this, started this huge 
renovation our house because you know what we're with six kids we've always been that house where we got crappy floors so they can rollerblade around like i like a home to be a home it's lived in i'm not gonna follow kids around with a wet ex and be like don't make a mess here like i'm just i'm just not that mom so anyway as they got older i'm like okay now it's time we got to do a full renovation we can have nice things you know we'll put new floors in move the kitchen to a different spot so it was a full renovation so what happened then was COVID hit. So my kids who were away at university got sent home. So suddenly I had six kids back, no main floor, and they're all homeschooling and I'm working from home. So we were a little short on space. But you know what? I got to say, talk about when you mentioned kind of the silver linings. For me, having them all home was kind of incredible because they really got to hang out with each other. And, you know, I had friends, a lot of friends who have onlys and they're like, my kid's not going to see another child for like a year. Whereas my kids were all in the pool together. They were playing Dungeons and Dragons, organizing movie nights. I actually, we would go for hikes. And I actually had a friend get me a shirt that said, yes, they're all mine. Because people would give me a stink eye. Like I was, I was with a bunch of kids who weren't my, like all six of them. You're outside your bubble. Exactly. And I was getting <laughs> judgy looks. So I had this t-shirt said that, yes, they're all mine. Because I was like out with all my kids, right? In the forest or, or whatever. So I did feel a little bit like with the entrepreneurs during COVID, some of them, it was our time to shine. But also for the moms of big families, it was also my time to shine because they entertain each other. Yeah. You know, one of my best friends, Wendy, her son has autism and some other things going on and they homeschool and he, because he has a, he's immune compromised as well. They were, had to be very diligent in the whole kind of like who they were around and stuff. And even now they're still careful. And she said to me the other day, I almost wish we could go back to the pandemic. Like it was easier because I didn't have to make up these excuses kind of or like explain about why we need to be on our own or whatever. 100%. I've got a couple of introvert friends who were just like, it was amazing. I didn't have to make up excuses not to go places, not to see people or people with social anxiety. They're like, I just got a free pass. Like, so it's kind of funny. But you know what? I feel like even for me, I learned, I feel like, you know, before, if I had a party, I felt like I had to invite a bunch of people. But then I was like, now I invite less people because I'm like, everybody just kind of, kind of, I think there was a natural thing that happened where people just ended up hanging out with the people that they really, because when we were limited to only a certain amount of people, you had to be very careful about your people. And the other thing I didn't do, Michelle, was I didn't sign my kids up for all the things anymore. You know, I had six kids in hockey and I'm like, two of them didn't want to go back after COVID. And normally I would have been like, no, nah, you got to get out there and play hockey. You got to play a sport, stay physical, good teamwork. But I'm like, forget it. I'm tired. Of, I realized I'm tired of driving around to arenas like every night. And yeah. And I was like, so everybody pick one or two things and hopefully you can be on the same team and we'll figure it out. But I definitely was like, no more drive throughs no more packing up thermoses and eating the car. We went really lower key with the extracurriculars. That was a big lesson for me. Never going back to that. Yeah, I, I think there's so many never going back to's. No, you know what? You realize these kids can go play on the court. They can play basketball or hockey on the court. They can get paper routes. They don't have to be programmed. Yeah, for sure. So when we talk about like people's rich life revolution, their own version of their rich life, do you consider you, your life to be a rich life? I sure do. <laughs> I, I got the best life. Like, honestly, no, I do. I, I do talk about this a little bit in the book, too, about this notion of having it all, because I feel like the notion of having it all is very gendered. People don't ask men if they have it all. They ask women or talk about women in the context of having it all. Like, and what does that even mean? Does it mean we have a couple of kids, a good, a good marriage or a partnership, uh, a white picket fence, a uh, good job, wine nights with our girlfriends, spa days with our whatever. Like, what does it even mean? And I really think, you know, having it all is having what you want. No, not everybody wants six kids. No, people don't necessarily want to make labels till two in the morning, you know, when they're pregnant with their fourth child. I get that, but I did. So that works for me. So, you know, I really encourage women not to let other people's notions of having it all get projected onto you. You're having it all and your me time and your self-care. My self-care looks totally different to most people's self-care. I don't want to go to a spa. I don't want to get a manicure. I don't want to have a coffee and flip through magazines. I want to talk to you, Michelle. This is my me time. 
So this energizes me and that's okay. People are always like, you need a break. No, I know what I need and I know what my family needs. So, you know, we need to remember that we're the experts in our own lives and not to let society project onto us what the traditional self carriers or what the traditional me time is or what a traditional life looks like. Totally. To I like hell yeah to the yeah all over the place. And I also think there's like a seasonality to our lives, right? Like I remember having a conversation with my brother, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago. And he was like, all you do is work. It's like cons all consuming in your life. Like you've got kids and a husband and all this stuff. And I'm like, it's actually, it's fun to me. It's my fun time. It's my I could do it all day long. Like it wouldn't bother me. I'm still there for my kids. I'm still doing all the kid things and the brownies and volunteering at the school and all the things, occasional date night, that kind of stuff. But I could have done it endlessly because that's where I was. That was that season where I am now. It looks a little bit different. It's not everything to me now, right? Like now I'm newly divorced. I, my kids are grown. They're 18, 19, 21. And all of a sudden I'm like, whoa, what do I do now? <laughs> yeah. And, and that's the thing too. Like that's just, we have to take our life like as it comes in waves. And like you say, that seasonality and you know what? And that's true for our businesses as well. Like I think, I don't know how to make a mail of labels. I could not, if I went in the production facility now, I could not make a label to save my life. But you know what? There are 40 people back there who know how to make the labels. If I was still making labels in the basement at two o'clock, this would be a colossal fail. I need to be thinking about the business. I need to be thinking about the marketing. I need to be, I can hire people to make the labels now, right? So even as our, like our journeys and our businesses change and in our lives, and it is, it is all very seasonal. I love the way you put it that way. Yeah. And speaking of that, I was so like, I had the biggest smile on my face when I read this part, because I talk about this all the time to clients. You said, don't be afraid to fill the gaps in your business, in your household and anywhere else. Free up your time so you can spend it on the things you truly, that truly bring you joy, things that move your big vision forward. I'm always telling people, I don't do laundry. I don't clean my house. I don't go grocery shopping. Like I pay people to do those things. 100%. I joke about how I've never even baked a birthday cake, but guess what? I can hire somebody to bake, there's six kids. I can hire somebody to bake a birthday cake and then they can hire me to make their kids labels. Let's, let's get, let this economy do its thing. Everybody do what you're good at. Hire the bakers, I'll be your label maker. And it actually, I find it very bothersome that somehow being a mother is lumped in to having the same skill set as being some sort of like housekeeper. Like to me, it's a completely different, like I'm a I'm very good mother. I am not a good cook. I'm not a good, that's like saying you should be a very good, you should be a very good architect and also a good lawyer. There's completely different skill sets, but somehow our lawyer and architect gets lumped in together with motherhood and house. I don't get it. Yeah. And I, I was just talking to somebody about this because I was on holidays, right? And I was on a this amazing yacht in Croatia and we had amazing meals, right? Cooked by a chef. And I was saying, I'm not a foodie, right? I love good food, but I'm not a person who will like go to do something because of the meal. 100%. I totally understand that. And I was like, I would, be, I would actually prefer if we lived in the Jetsons where you just took a pill and that yeah, was yeah. good. Like <laughs> that would make sense to me. I never cook. I don't like cooking. I don't do grocery shopping. Like when my kids, my daughters were in Mexico for a week, I had raspberries for like three days because they were in season. Michelle, I feel so <laughs> seen right now. I am not a foodie as well. And I often say I don't seem to enjoy food the way most other people do. So if my kids are away, like I, I've got friends who go to bed with cookbooks and they're always new recipes, but they love food. So like if my kids are around, I, I'm having a bowl of cereal. To me, it's too much effort for the enjoyment you get out of it you know to me it's not worth the investment yeah exactly it's so funny i've never met somebody quite like that and this i feel really connected right now <laughs> people are always like what do you people are always like what do you mean you don't enjoy, enjoy food the way most people do <laughs> okay i am super curious what is like one of the top things or top lessons that you would share with a woman who feels like uh, it's too late to get their brilliant idea out into the world or no one will want it or like they have this like hesitation. 
I think that's, it's kind of natural. I mean, anytime you're putting yourself out there, you feel a little bit like, whoa, but I would say definitely connect with other like-minded women, get in a peer group or get in a, um, like a, a get a mentor, get a mentor who can help you with this because these are the people who are going to rise, raise you up. And, you know, being an entrepreneur or bringing out an idea can be a very lonely experience. I think it is like motherhood. Motherhood can be very lonely too. So you've got to make sure you're, sur you're, you're surrounding yourself with, with good people who will, will listen to you and help you and want you to do well, who will be your cheerleaders. I completely agree that, you know, like, I think that goes along with so many things, whether that's, you know, you have a, you are like a career person aspiring to get to the top of your career, you need a mentor, right? Like you need to have good people in your life who are going to like, like lift you up. Yeah, exactly. And then you need to do that to the people that are wanting to be like you or where you're at. Exactly. And that's why like at this point, you know, 20 years in, I'm, I have a formal mentoring relationship with a couple of young women who are entrepreneurs. It's, it's really important to me that we uh, give back and share knowledge. And I'm sure, Michelle, that's what you're doing through this podcast. Yeah. Oh, for sure. And, you know, one of the things I want to do is make like inspiration and the reality of business and reality of creating wealth in your life available to everybody. Like, it's, I don't feel like it's something you should have to pay an arm and a leg for. There's so many people out there who are like charging gazillion dollars to tell you how to, you know, I don't know, do whatever. And it's just like, uh, can we make this accessible to everyone? Because I know for sure when I started my business, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know where to go. And I even think like when I had my first baby, it's the same. I'm telling you, it's exactly, it's the like, same. there's no manual, like entrepreneurship there and motherhood, isn't. I swear are so intrinsically tied together. Yeah. And like all of a sudden this little person is like dependent on you. I was petrified. <laughs> Pint-sized dictator. Right. <laughs> right. I was like, what do I do now? I got to keep this thing alive. I know. And they never, they, and they never go away. They're always there. <laughs> <laughs> right? I just remember like that with my first coming over from the hospital and putting his car seat down in the living room going, huh? Guess you're staying. <laughs> right? Like, we're, I guess we're here now. And, you know, my kids are, you know, even though they're grown, they're still around and they're still. Totally, it's a job for totally. life. <laughs> yeah, it's a lifer. <laughs> I think, you know, like, you shared a really great thing there mentorship and surrounding yourself with people. Would you share with us something that you really struggled with as a mom, a wife, a business owner? Like, was there like, a thing that you're like, oh, this, I had to work through this. You know, I feel like I've had a pretty good go of it all. Like, honestly, I feel like, and I, I want to acknowledge my privilege here for a moment because here's the thing. When my son was diagnosed with autism, we were spending $40,000 a year on therapy and I was not working. I was starting a business. So a lot of people in that position would not have been able to drop out of the traditional workforce, but daddy was making enough that we could get by and do those things. So I do want to acknowledge, like, sometimes there's single women out there who have brilliant ideas, but they literally have to have two jobs. They're raising their babies and they have to keep the lights on. So maybe then their business idea comes a little later on when their kids are older or whatever. So I just do want to acknowledge that. So I feel like I didn't have the struggles that many entrepreneurs do do face. But I think the other advantage I had was that there were four co-founders. So when any one of us was kind of being a Debbie Downer or being like, what are we, what were we thinking? We're never going to do this. Oh my God, we're going to lose our shirts. Oh, one of the others would be like, Hey, tight, don't forget. We've done this, 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 we've got this on the horizon. So whenever one of us had a, a panic mode or like hit imposter syndrome or something like that, the other partners could swoop in and be like, no, babe, I gotcha. You know, so we had sort of that built in peer group. So it wasn't lonely, like sometimes being a solo entrepreneur can be. Yeah. Lonely. Yeah. <laughs> and like, you got to remember too, in those early days, like 20 years ago, there weren't like Facebook groups. There weren't like, if you wanted to meet other entrepreneurs, you had to go to like an awkward room networking event. Like a chamber of commerce or something. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And have your like little glass of wine and be like, hi, I'm making labels. Like in my basement. <laughs> in my basement. Somebody buy my labels. Right. <laughs> so... 
you know, there weren't the online resources that there are now. So it was particularly challenging and lonely back then for solo entrepreneurs. Yeah. And there was there certainly wasn't all the girl boss and the boss babe yeah, and all that right. kind of marketing around it. Right. It was not glamorous whatsoever. So. So tell me a little bit about what you think about money and wealth and women. You know, I think sometimes what I've learned is that sometimes women seem to be afraid to make money. And we know that women-owned businesses are more philanthropic. We give more. We um, we just know this statistically. That's why having women leaders is so important because it's just good for our not only our economy, but it's actually good for our society. And of course, we also know this, that there are more CEOs named James in Canada than there are women CEOs. So we've still got our, our jobs to do, ladies. We got work, our work cut out for us. But I don't think there's any shame in your game of making money. And, you know, at the end of the day, you know, people will have an expectation. But I'm like, you know what? I'm not a non-for-profit. I'm here to make money. And the fact of the matter is when I make money, and I found this, I don't know if you found this too, Michelle, like for me, the biggest responsibility was when we hired people. Cause I'm like, now we got to make our goals. Now we got to sell because I want to keep these people employed. They're feeding their families. They're sending their kids to university. This is, we have, I, I felt very responsible for other people's lives. Once we hired people and for us to ensure their success, we have to make sure the business is successful as well. Absolutely. So it is a proven thing. It, studies have shown that when women have money, they spend their money differently than men. They spend it in their communities. They shop local. They lend money to their friends who live around the corner from them. They put money into their kids' schools. Like Women are very different in their money practices than men. So for me... More women having more money means that our communities change. 100%. It is good. That's what I'm saying it is good for our com communities. But also when women are making their own money and have their own wealth, they are less likely to stay in an abusive relationship. They are less likely to stay in a, a marriage that is unfulfilling. They are, there are so many personal benefits. And then when you're doing that, you're a role model to other women being like, I can leave that terrible marriage or I don't need. And to your kids, your kids will think, oh, good, women can do these things. So for your daughters and for your sons to be like, you know what, these are the expectations. And my mom's the role model for that. For sure. And obviously, entrepreneurship is a great thing that can bring more money into women's lives. And it can be done, like you said, around having kids and all of the different hats that we tend to wear as women in the world. And even if you have a job, you can have a side hustle. Like I just met this gal who like, she has a job, like she works for Starbucks, like a regional manager or something, but she's got a Instagram account where she, I don't know, shows people what she bought on Amazon or something. And she makes she makes like $5,000 a month doing that. And, and women do this all the time. I was just talking to a woman this morning because I'm having a, a bunch of girlfriends over on the weekend for a girl's weekend, my university pals. So she's making, actually, she's making us mugs that say, my name is Julie Elizabeth Cole. And it's and the, my friends are all staying over for the weekend because my kids are in camp. And it's called JEC's Summer Camp for Exceptional Middle-Aged Women. So she's, she's making a logo and she's making mugs, but she's a real estate agent. So she, you know, she's a real estate agent, but she's making mugs and t-shirts and doing all sorts of things. So, and yeah, the stats for women picking up side hustles during COVID was crazy high. It was amazing. Everybody was flexing their entrepreneurial muscles. And of course, which is equally as important when women have money, they charities blossom. We're usually very philanthropic with our money. And I'm in so many giving circles. I do so much philanthropic work. And also like, you know, if I'm speaking in a corporate event, I charge. But if I'm speaking for like a women's group, that's a nonprofit, I'll be like, I'll do this one on the house, you know, like, so there are, there's lots and like a lot of guy speakers won't do that. Right. So no, we're good. We're just good people. What can we say, Michelle? Yeah, we're the best. <laughs> okay, so final thing I want to drop here because this, I love this, and I was like, I feel like I've heard this before, but you brought this home. It was one of your biz hacks in one of the ending chapters. 
When a friend of yours starts a business, give them something that they would need for regular business use. Like a baby shower, but it's a business shower. Oh, yeah, exactly. I'm like, why are we not doing this? Like, this right? is, we do the baby shower thing. We do the wedding shower thing. We do all that. I'm like, why are we not doing this? Because like you mentioned, we birth a business, okay? Like this is this is just as hard as labor. For sure. And you know, it's so interesting because that just reminded me like this weekend, these girls who are coming over for the weekend, we went for a weekend away 20 years ago and they were all there as the university friends. And we sat around, we, you know, it was amazing we got to go away because we had little kids. But we had boxes and boxes and boxes of Mabel's Labels flyers that needed stamps on them because it was for going to summer camps that all the summer camps had their own stamps. And these girls sat around all weekend and stamped these flyers for us. And I mean, obviously lots of wine was consumed and all that good stuff. But I'm like, that was the baby shower. And them sitting that, like that would have taken us months and months. But with the 10 of us sitting around the tables, just stamping and laughing, we got through it all in a weekend and we had boxes and boxes. And that was just like, that's the sisterhood, man. That is a sisterhood. That's what you do. You just show up. I remember, so I had my children in England and everything there is midwife based, right? It's not kind of doctor based. So I feel really grateful that I had that experience because midwives are very different than the kind of Western medicine doctor intervention thing. But I remember my midwife was there because they do like home visits after the birth, right? So you, your midwife comes over in the first two weeks, they came over every day. And then after that, it was like a couple times a week. And then it peters out. And uh, my midwife was there and a friend came over to see, visit, see the baby or whatever, right? And brought like a card and a little, you know, present or whatever. And the midwife said, the present is nice, but the best thing you can do is make her a cup of tea and then go put her laundry on. 100%. And I was like, what? Oh, I said that. I mean, obviously I had many, many babies and I was like, do not bring me little onesies. You take my toddler to the park for the afternoon. If you really want to be helpful, I will tell you how you start a meal train for me. Like I will, I will, <laughs> I will tell you what to do. And then I say, thank you. And I don't send a card because you know what? I don't have time to send cards, but I'm just as grateful. <laughs> right? Yeah. I think communication is key. You know, tell people what you need, tell people what you want, you know, whether it's in your business or in your personal life. Like, just communicate it. Yeah, just say it, right? And like we said, no's are free. <laughs> I was just like, oh, this kind of flips everything on its head for me. Like, it's not about going and visiting somebody. It's about going and being of service to someone. And so it's, you know, it's, you can do the same thing in your business. I always say money follows service and it follows value. So as long as you provide value and you're providing a great service, the money will follow. Most important thing, you are fixing a problem. Right. And in Mabel's labels, that's what you did. You fixed a problem. You filled a gap and you provided an amazing service and you provided incredible value. And so the money came. Oh, thank you. And that's such a great little formula you just spoke of there. That really that really speaks to me. Yeah, it's truly how I live my life. It's how I built my business. And it's what I tell my team. I just said that to them this morning when somebody was worried about something. I'm like, all you have to do is provide an amazing service and deliver value. I don't care about anything else. Thank you so much. This is amazing conversation. Oh, thanks, Michelle. And if anybody wants to like look me up and find my socials, everything can be found at mableslabels.com slash Julie Cole. And they can order my book there. Yay. Totally. Like this book, Gold. Yeah, like a mother. Yeah, it's on Amazon or online at any bookstore, your favorite books uh, seller. So we'll put all the links in the show notes and everything. So everybody will get that. I just really want to thank you. Like you are not, you know, just somebody toiling away in the middle of Canada somewhere doing something. You're a pretty big deal. And so thank you for taking the time to talk with me. And oh, I'm so I'm so glad we connected. Thanks, Michelle. I hope that you enjoyed this episode with Julie Cole. I love this conversation. The biggest takeaway for me was delegate, delegate, delegate. I think often as women, we think we should be superheroes and be able to do it all. Asking your neighbor's kid to take your son to the park for an hour, hiring a cleaning service, ordering your daughter's birthday cake from a local bakery. It doesn't have to be work-related. I want you to consider 
What in your life can you delegate? Thanks for hanging out with me. I hope you got at least one gold nugget today. Be sure to grab your copy of the Rich Life Revolution workbook to help you set the foundation for your next level of wealthy. Get it now at richliferevolution.ca and I'll see you later.